Here we are with part three of the Lifestyle Recon R4 Rundown. Now, if you missed part one, in that episode, I introduced the camper and the lineup and the range of models in the Recon range. I spoke about all of the external features, the hardware, brake suspension, and of course, all of the exterior mounted storage options. In part two, we went inside. We had a look at the designed layout, the appliances, the fridges, and of course, our sleeping arrangements, and finally finished up with that famous lifestyle kitchen. In this third and final installment in this mini series, we are detailing some of the electrical and water hardware that gives us our full off-grid capabilities when we travel this huge country of ours. In parts one and two, I captioned any optional extras that we decided to add to the build as we moved forward. But in this episode, I'm not going to do that. Almost everything we talk about today is an optional extra, so there's no need to caption each one. Without further ado, let's get straight into it. Now in the first two episodes, I've done a full walk around of the interior and the exterior of this camper and showing you all of the components. But it's two areas that I haven't covered just yet and they both exist in this huge storage area. So let's get all of this gear out and get straight into it. Let's see if we can clean this area up a little. That's much better. Now once all of our gear is removed, it gives us access to these two very large false floor hinged panels and lifting these up gives us access to some of the utility equipment in this camper, including some of our water tanks. So let's start with the water capabilities. Now to recap, there are six outlets that these water tanks are plumbed to supply. These include the kitchen sink, the interior sink, exterior shower, interior shower, onboard toilet and drawbar tap. The Recon R4T SE model comes standard with three 90 litre heavy duty poly water tanks. These are the three tanks that we can see under these access hatches. They are plumbed together in series, so they both fill and drain at the same rate. We can see here the main supply line coming into the tanks and with the connecting hoses and on top the breathers which terminate into a single hose. The filler point on this tank is located at the rear of the van and this houses a wide opening for the fill point and incorporates the vent for the breather tubes too. Now the fill points have only recently been moved to the rear panel of the camper here and they used to be located down here on the side panel underneath this storage hatch but there are a couple of issues with the gravity fill so having them on the rear here lifts them up a little bit higher and allows the water to easily fill and remain within those tanks. The three tanks are drained together by a 12 volt flow jet water pump located here at the rear of this compartment and these draw about 8 amps when in use and after it passes through the pump it is then split into whichever outlet requires the water. Between the tanks and this water pump, Lifestyle have also included an inline BEST or best water filter. So in the unlikely circumstance that you were to get debris in your tank, this filter should take care of it. In addition to this, it is easy and cost effective to change these filters periodically. Now to provide power to that pump, there is a switch in the kitchen compartment of this camper. Activating this switch will provide power to the pump, which can self prime in its location and will automatically switch off when pressurized, essentially meaning that it can be left on indefinitely. Three tanks totaling 270 litres is more than enough for our needs. We're a family of four living out of this camper full time and generally the highest water usage appliance will be our shower, which we don't compromise on. We all make sure we all have at least one shower every single day and this in conjunction with dishwashing, hand washing and toilet use, we can last up to seven days. Yes, that's correct, up to seven days, but that is at a stretch and it's what we call super conservative mode. Generally, we last all comfortable around the four to five day mark, which is how we generally treat our water consumption. Another great design feature of this camper is the hot water system, which is located underneath the front dinette seat inside the camper. This is also behind this panel right here. And behind this wall just here, next to it is our shower, which means unlike the Jayco caravan that we used to have where the hot water system was in the opposite corner to the shower, we don't waste much water when turning on the shower and waiting for that hot water to come through. Now I spoke about it briefly in episode two, but we are utilizing the Truma Ultra Rapid gas hot water system. It comprises of a 14 litre tank and is heated solely off a gas source. Once the gas bottles are turned on, the exterior vent hatch is open. This unit will only take about 13 minutes to come to temperature. The interior switch allows a temperature of either 60 or 70 degrees Celsius. In our experience, the 60 degree setting is more than enough. It's rare that we'll ever use the shower mixer more than halfway when in use. And further to that, this system is incredibly efficient. Even after it's turned off after the last shower and overnight temperatures drop into the single digits, there will still be hot water remaining in here in the morning for washing the dishes. This being said, it's also incredibly efficient on gas usage and we've lasted up to two months on a single four kilo gas bottle. So to say we're impressed is an understatement. 
Now this is all fairly standard equipment, but in addition to this, we've also opted to include a separated and dedicated drinking water tank, which holds a further 50 liters of water. This tank is also mounted in that rear storage area. However, it's tucked away as up here in the rear corner. This tank is only small and filled by a separate filler point installed on the rear of the camper. Everything that's related to that particular drinking water tank is completely separated from our general water storage. So that means that we have a separate fill point, separate plumbing, a separate 12 volt pump, and even separate outlets. The 12 volt pump being the same flow jet unit as the general tanks is located under the kitchen sink. It's also activated by a switch in the kitchen area and works in the same way. There's also another best inline water filter installed. However, this tank and pump only supplies two outlets one in the kitchen area and the other on the interior sink. Now this additional and separated drinking water tank has got to be up there with one of our favorite accessories that we've added to this build. Now generally we fill both of these water storage options from the same source because we're either filling up in towns or from a reliable source. But when we head out bush and head remote, we can fill up that general water storage with whatever we find, whether it be unreliable, un unknown sources, or even from nearby streams without having to worry that we've contaminated our drinking water. In the high country, we were based from a particular camp for some time and wanted some longer showers. So we pumped water from nearby rivers into the general water tanks and this still preserved high quality drinking water in this extra tank. Now the length of time that this additional drinking water tank will last will obviously depend on the circumstance. For us, it's generally anywhere between six days and two weeks. And this depends on obviously the environmental and weather conditions, but also whether or not we're doing big hikes or big driving days. Now it should be noted that both of these tanks can be drained individually from an outlet pipe just underneath the rear of the camper here. It is a very small outlet so it does take some time but it's there if you need it. To monitor the water tank status at any time we have the Sign Marine control panel here mounted in the kitchen compartment. The two tanks are displayed in both litre and percentage capacities. Now after six months of use we have come to realise that this isn't an exact measurement but simply an indication. And this is because the sender units in the tanks are just float styled senders which estimate the water remaining on a water level within those tanks not on flow output. And this has never been an issue for us but it's just something to keep in mind and as those water tanks come down it gives you a good indication as to when you should start looking for points to refill. Now this water system has worked really well for our families. We've traveled around Australia for six months full time so far. And this capacity here, in conjunction with the 55 litres that we carry on onboard tanks in the cruiser, has been more than enough for all of our adventures. In addition to all of that, we also carry a 105 litre water bladder that can sit in the rear footwell of the Land Cruiser. So if needed, we can cart a full 160 litres of water from a reliable source back to the camper when it's set up off grid and in remote areas. Now water storage is incredibly important, but the other main factor for off-grid living is of course power. This is one of my favorite topics of conversation with this camper. Now the Lifestyle Recon R4T SE comes standard with one 200 amp hour battery, a 30 amp 240 volt charger, 30 amp DC charger, and a 50 amp solar controller with two 175 watt solar panels on the roof. Now, of course, this wasn't enough for us and we've upgraded all of that. But before we get into the full details of this electrical system, let's quickly recap what sort of appliances that we have drawing from this system. First up, the fridge. And this is a Thetford 175 litre fridge and is 12 volt only. This draws straight from the lithium batteries and although relatively efficient, this still draws more power than I first thought it would. Keeping in mind, I do keep the freezer at its maximum setting of minus 18 degrees. Inside the camper, we have all of the 12 volt LED lighting, six roof lights, step lights, entry lights, two Sirocco fans, and 12 volt outlets at each corner of the bed and on the main bench. There's a 240 volt outlet in here that is wired to the inverter. Moving outside and we have three exterior lights, a handle light, those two water pumps, LED strips in the kitchen and the storage compartments, exterior 240 volt outlets, generally used for styling internet, and a dual 240 volt GPO in the kitchen. But there is no denying that the biggest and most consistent draw on our electrical setup is this. This is the Safari dual induction cooktop and is wired to a single 240 volt GPO underneath the kitchen and is our main and only source of cooking appliance in this camper. There's no denying that we are running quite a power hungry electrical setup. So to supply all of that power, we are running three 200 amp hour Zeal lithium batteries. Now we initially started with two batteries, however soon realized that induction uses a lot in conjunction with our other power needs and a couple of days without solar would bring about power anxiety. 
Now, all of these batteries are wired in parallel together, which gives us that 12 volt output. But all of this supplies some of the electrical wizardry behind this panel here. Undoing the three screws in the left hand side and this entire wall hinges to the rear of this storage section, providing full access to all of the electrical componentry installed in this setup. There is no doubt this is a seriously impressive electrical setup, so let's have a bit of a closer look. Now with a lot of the accessories on this camper being 12 volt and the batteries also outputting 12 volt, they can be run straight through general automotive fuses. So on the left hand side of this control panel, we see all of those 12 volt accessories. But the magic in this system is this. The Victron MultiPlus 3KVA 240 volt inverter. This unit is an absolute monster in the portable power supply world and has to be one of the best systems on the market at present for inverter and charger setups. Now I'm not going to go over all of the features and specifications of this inverter for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it's well beyond my level of expertise and secondly, it would just take too long. But what you need to know is a 3 kVA inverter is equivalent to 2400 watts and that puts out plenty for a high power demand electrical system. In our setup, we can draw up to 400 amps for a few minutes without difficulty. So this means that we can have our induction cooked off on and boiling water, as well as say, putting the toaster on or even the kettle if we want to. The inverter generally cuts out at about 450 amps output, but however, simply resetting the switch off and on again, we are back in business. Now this inverter doubles up as a 240 volt battery charger as well. So when you're plugged into shore power, whether that be from someone's house, a caravan park, or even your generator, you're going to be pumping in 120 amps into the lithium battery capacity. Now, in addition to that, you also have a bypass feature. Now, I'm not sure of the technical term for this, but what I'm trying to describe here is the fact that when you are plugged into shore power, you can be using any or all of the appliances on this camper, and it's not going to be running through that battery system. And there's two advantages for this. Firstly, you're not reducing the longevity of these batteries by simply recharging and discharging them at the same time. And secondly, you could be using all of the appliances in this camper at the same time as pumping that full 120 amps charge back into your battery's capacity. Now that's great for when you're plugged into shore power, but we don't buy these campers to be parked up in caravan parks. So what about when we're off grid? Now with all of the componentry going on here, we can be bringing in, let's say 50 amps of solar through the rooftop panels, and that 400 amps that we can use or withdraw from the batteries will now increase to 450 because we're taking that 50 off from solar input. So the inverter can use that bypass feature to have a net value after solar is inputted as well. Now there are many, many more features that this unit possesses, but there are also many videos out there that can describe and demonstrate these features much more succinctly than I can with a lot more detail. So we've covered how we can use and draw down that battery capacity in this camper, but what about charging it back up again? Now, as we mentioned, we can put in 120 amps back into the batteries through that 240 volt charger. But 120 amps is also important when you're using it with a generator. So I carry a Honda EU22i generator with me and the 120 amps represents a full 2000 watts, which means that that generator is working at 100% load. Now, of course, it burns through fuel quite quickly, but it also means that we can charge up those batteries just as quickly too. Moving down, and we also have a Victron 30 amp DC-DC charger, which is this blue box here. This essentially takes a 12 volt power source and attempts to recharge the batteries at a maximum of 30 amp. Now, this is of course connected to an Anderson plug on the front drawbar of this camper, which will be connected to the vehicle while you're driving. Realistically, I generally see about 25 amps coming into the batteries after some voltage drop and efficiency loss, which is great, but it's not much when you can consider that we have 600 amp hour of capacity. So we could be driving for up to four hours continuously and only recharge 17% of the battery's capacity. So it's quite insignificant in the grand scheme of things. With this being the case, the overwhelming majority of our charge input is provided by solar. Now, like I mentioned, standard it comes with two 175 watt solar panels on the roof, but we've upgraded this to three 360 watt panels, giving us a grand total of just over a kilowatt of solar on the roof of this camper. Now, generally with these quoted figures, they are just that, they're quoted figures, and we don't see quite as high as that, but I can attest that we have seen 1,079 watts coming in off those roof panels alone. And that is at a total of 77 amps at 12 volts. That's equivalent to 99.9% .9 efficient, which is just incredible. 
Now, because I can and because I want to, I've added some portable solar panels to the system as well. Now, I've always carried a set of Bluetti PV 200 watt solar panels in the back of the Land Cruiser, and I've done a whole video on how efficient and effectively they've worked in my setup. And being wired in parallel, it also means they reduce the chance of being affected by partial shade. So because of this, I've not only got one, not two, but three of these portable panels that I can wire together to add to the camper's charging capacity. Now, some of you may have picked up that I'm running a 70 amp MPPT charger and I've already seen up to 77 amps of input. So I can't run these portable panels into this particular charger and I simply can't plug them directly into that battery bank. Lifestyle have included a gray Anderson plug in the rear of the camper that connects to the batteries directly without a solar charger. All I've gone and done is purchased my own Victron MPPT 150 amp solar charger to manage the Bluetti array. Now it doesn't matter if that array is wired together in parallel or series, this charger will handle it and can bring in it up to 39 amps of additional solar input, but generally we see around the mid to low 30s. Now this solar system that I've set up in this camper has just worked perfectly for our needs. In fact, I can bring in over 100 amp of solar input at any one time. Personally, I've seen 103.5 at its absolute maximum, but here recorded, I got the mid to high 90s, which is still just incredible in really good solar conditions. And I should also mention that because we're using all of the Victron gear together, these devices can talk to each other. So I've set up a local network for the solar MPPT chargers to be involved in so they can share data like the battery voltages, the solar input voltages, the temperatures and amperage coming in from each of those arrays. It combines this knowledge together to provide the best charging profile for my lithium battery bank. It should be noted as well, that this is in perfect conditions. And one thing I figured out, it does not take much to interrupt those perfect conditions. Temperature being a big factor in the solar systems, we generally don't see these sorts of figures, but it is possible. Now I know the next question is going to be why? Why on earth do I need 100 amp of solar coming into this camper at any one time? And there's two reasons that I've set it up this way. The first one is bad weather. We are heavily reliant on the 12 volt system and the electrical system in this camper. And bad weather very quickly or immediately diminishes that solar input. With an overpowered system, we can still receive respectable figures even in high cloud or poor weather conditions. Take this example here when we were located in Armidale in New South Wales. We were between storms and staying at a farm state, relying on our solar input. We were bringing in mid to high 40 amps of solar input in some very average weather conditions with high cloud cover. So simply put, the more solar that is available, the more solar input we can get in these vulnerable conditions. And the second reason is when using high powered appliances during the day when we're camped up. So let's take an example of the air conditioning unit on the roof of this camper here. That air conditioning unit, when the compressor is running, draws about 60 amp of power. Now you might be thinking, well, you can pull in 70, so that's no problems, and that is correct, but that would only leave about 10 or maybe just more in optimal conditions to charge those batteries. Now we regularly get down to between 45 and 60% in the morning when we wake up after cooking our evening meal, boiling the kettle a few times and awaiting for those solar conditions to optimize in the middle of the day. And given that we have such a large 600 amp hour capacity, it does take a long time to charge. So if we start using the air conditioning, we're simply not going to be fully recharged by the end of the day. And using high powered appliances like air conditionings is just simply not viable. Plugging in the arrays and having quite a bit more capacity to bring in, we can still use those high powered appliances at the same time as bringing in respectable charging figures for our batteries. Many will be topped up by the end of the day and still have plenty of power for things like our induction cooktop and other charging requirements. This is a lot of technical information and I know that most people are not going to need a system quite this large, but I love just pushing the limits to see what we can draw and recharge, particularly since we're using a renewable resource. Not only is it good for the environment, but we're essentially being able to regenerate all of our own power and remain off grid indefinitely and using things like the induction cooktop, we are really limiting our use of gas too. Now, for those of you who are interested in maybe looking at buying a system as similar to ours, I'm going to run through a few appliances you may use at home or perhaps appliances that you may be taking in your camper to go off grid with, just to show you realistically how much power they draw. Now, firstly, the 12 volt fridge in this camper will pull anywhere between two and 6.5 amp of current draw, depending on the temperature and humidity. We generally see about five amps while the compressor is on, but this will quickly increase in hot weather or if being opened frequently. Now keep in mind that the fridge compressor will turn on and off to regulate that temperature. So it's not gonna be drawing five amp every hour all the time. But to be honest, this 175 liter fridge does stay on a lot. So it is quite power hungry. 
Now, LED lights don't draw much, but if we turn on all of the interior and exterior lights and kitchen and storage LED strips, you can see that the total is around four to five amps. So it's noticeable, but you would never ordinarily have this much running together. The water pumps will draw about eight amps each. And again, these are generally only on for short periods and rarely run at the same time. Now, household appliances say like a hairdryer will draw anywhere between 130 and 200 amps of power, depending on the size and heat settings. And this cheap 240 volt kettle here pulls about 180 amp when turned on and the toaster about 70 amp. And most importantly, the induction cooktop. And I say most importantly because if you selected this for your build, then you have to rely on this as your sole method of cooking. So it needs to work correctly and for the time required. The Safari dual burner cooktop has a right burner being slightly larger and higher powered than the left. They both turn on the same way and have the same temperature adjustments on the scale between one and nine. Now, one thing to note with induction cooktops, regardless of whether it's Safari or other brands, is that when they get down to lower temperatures, they click on and off to regulate that lower temperature. So for the Safari unit here, options between one and three will switch on and off intermittently to regulate those lower temperatures. And you'll hear that click in the background. Settings four to nine will remain on and increase in power demand as they're scaled up. Now setting four is enough to provide a rolling boil and will draw about 90 amps on the right burner. Turning this all the way up to level nine, this draws about 130 amps, but will also provide you with extreme heat, more so than your average gas burner can provide. The left burner, although very similar, will draw about 60 amps on setting four and 130 amps on setting nine. What's very important to know with dual burner induction cooktops is they can't both be set to high temperatures. So if you're using both of these burners at the same time, their max power setting is level four. So if you have them both on at the same time, you'll be drawing about 160 amps of power. Now there's almost an indefinite range of appliances that you can use with a 240 volt inverter, but to see whether a particular appliance will work in your setup, there is quite a simple calculation. And for example, let's use this 240 volt kettle here. You find the appliance and they'll all have a tag somewhere on them. This will give you a power in wattage. So this one here is at 2,200 watts. All you do is you divide that by 12. This will give you a rough estimate on how many amps it will draw from a 12 volt source. In this case, about 183 amps. It's not a perfect science, but it will give you a very good starting point. This power system is probably more on the extreme side and I completely understand and accept that most people don't need and probably don't want a system quite as complex and as large as this. After all, we buy these types of campers and vehicles to get away from it all, not to be consumed by our battery level and experience power anxiety. But for me, I enjoy this type of thing. I find it intriguing how we can cook multiple meals a day using electricity and power all of our household creature comforts from a battery capacity that could be fully replenished from a renewable resource that's free of charge and good for the environment at the same time. As a young family of four, Power and portability is a big part of our lives and enables us to give us routine and accessibility as we travel around Australia. With all of these features, with 320 litres of water on board, more battery power to get poker stick at and solar to charge for days, I truly do believe that we have one of the best possible design systems for our needs. And it means that we can freely set up wherever we want, whenever we want for quite some time. We don't have to worry about how long the fridge door is kept open for, how much water is in the kettle, how much time we spend boiling water on the induction cooktop. It just takes care of itself, which means that we can take less time worrying about this and more time focusing on this. With this setup as it currently stands, we can last comfortably between four and five days, but up to seven days at a stretch, which means that we can go out further on the map and stay out there much longer, which is perfect for our adventures. But this being said and done, this is the end of the Lifestyle Recon mini series. We have covered everything on this camper from the exterior storage, external features, interior layouts, appliances, sleeping arrangements, kitchen, and now the off gear capabilities. I truly do hope that this series has provided some useful information, not only to see what's involved in the Lifestyle Recon lineup, but also potentially what you might be looking for in your next build. I've hoped you've enjoyed these videos and hopefully you enjoy watching some of our adventures as we travel around Australia. But I'll be sure to see you next time on Exploring Oz. Cheers.
Thank you.